Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks, and today we got Larry Mazza. How you doing, Larry? I'm doing great. Good to see you. Thanks for inviting me again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for joining me today. So My pleasure. A lot of people liked our interview we did. I get a lot of compliments about it, about the questions I ask you. And um, they they say it's different. It's a different look on Mm -hmm. on the interview. And um, one of the things I wanted to ask you to maybe walk me through is when you first met Linda and Greg, like the first day, the first day you ever came into your life, either one of them. You know, it is. 45 years ago, okay? I was 17. So do the math, I'm 62. It's a long time. So, but I do believe it or not, I remember the very first time I, I met Linda, and it was in the supermarket uh, because she was uh, a knockout. She was gorgeous at the time. And, you know, uh, I wasn't going to not notice that at my age. And then it's funny, she became very friendly. And one thing led to the other. Most people know where it went, so I'm not going to get into all those details again. Uh, yeah. We became we became lovers, uh, and it lasted almost ten years. So it wasn't a joke. There were true feelings, uh, but it, it was. Um, she was just a beautiful girl uh, in her 30s, and I. The first time I saw her, I could only you know fantasize about being with her. Most guys our age would, you know, she was older than me and everything. But uh, eventually, it did happen. And the first time I met Greg is very, very uh, vivid to me, too. It's because, Are you nervous? Are you really nervous when you... Oh, yeah. 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 But I don't know who he is. I still what, don't know. What, is, what does she tell you before you meet Well, him? you know, she would tell me that he was... Uh, uh, he, he's into a lot of businesses. He knows a lot of people. He's influential. But I wasn't putting it to that. I'm thinking, well, he may be a big neighborhood doctor. He may be a big businessman. He may be... Uh, uh, Anything I never thought of gangster. I, you know, I didn't, and I never knew his real name. She told me at the beginning he was Charles Shiro. And there's a whole story about why that name is the name that was used. Uh, but I'm thinking that. And when he, and the day that I'm finally going to meet him, where she convinces me after several months that it'll be good for you and it'll help you out in businesses, all different things. So I'm waiting at the door and I'm watching cars go by, you know, Volkswagen goes by, uh, Chevy goes by. Of course, the big black Fleetwood with tinted windows pulls up and pulls in the driveway. And when he got out of the car, you look at the picture in the back with the sunglasses that you have there. He had those sunglasses on. Yeah. It was it was nighttime. The one further to the right, he was much older and he was very sick. So that's not the imposing figure that you see right behind you. And he had a sport jacket on, the shirt open, the hanky. I mean, I know everything about him said gangster. Now I started putting it together. I knew he wasn't a, you know, a doctor or a businessman, a traveling salesman. And the walk, I'll never forget how he walked to the door. He he strutted or swaggered. He, he had a, a gait real slow. His arms didn't move type of guy, if somebody beat the horn, he wouldn't turn like this. He would turn like this. His whole body would have to turn like a shock. And uh, I started putting it together then that this, okay, he's not the slouch I was hoping he was. Uh, But then he comes to the door. He puts his hand out. I put my hand out. I says, hi, I'm Larry. And he says, with a real deep voice, straight mom voice, he says, I'm Greg. And right then I knew... More, something was wrong. Why she told me he was Charles Shiro. He's introducing his Greg. He goes upstairs or inside first to, you know, maybe take his jacket off, change, get ready to go out to eat dinner. And as soon as he walked out, I told him this. I thought his name was Charles. She said, oh, he just uses that name. So all of this is like hitting me at once. I never heard of such a thing. My name's Larry. I'm not going to go around calling myself Charles, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and then he comes back in and it's funny. For the most part, I would have wine with Linda. We would drink, drink some wine. That night, I said, you know, let me have a vodka because I wanted to get drunk. Get so the heads a, off, right? I have a vodka, and then all of a sudden, he comes back. He's got two scotches in his hand. 
on the rocks. So I had to go now have scotch. And I don't, to this day, I don't mix. If I have wine, I stay with wine. If I have vodka, I stay with I don't mix because it's not a good morning usually, you know? Oh, it's terrible. Uh, but then more than ever, I didn't because I wasn't really, didn't know anything about drinking. You know, we had kid drinks, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Se seven and seven, vodka and orange juice, you know, and here Mixing I am. with I, beer and, and right, wine or yeah, whatever but, you get your hands right, on, basically, right? right? Right. But that night, I had my first scotch, and we went out to eat. It was very, it was, a, I'll, I'll never forget that. I can almost tell you what he was wearing, you know, but, but a sport jacket, the color, you know, uh, the car, everything about that. And like I said, the first time I met her, I remember too. But then there was so many meetings after it, so many times I was with him early on. People say, you know, what, what happened to, you know, and it's hard to remember that long back. You yeah. know, unless it was a real uh, important event, you know, obviously we never forget those. The nervousness, does it go away after a little while? Or are you like well, still on edge? I did, I did. Well, you know, she didn't make it easy because when I'm we're walking to the car to go out to eat dinner, she like actually puts her arm in mine. You know, how you walk with a girl that put their arm in your arm. And I'm like, so I'm looking at it like, what are you doing? You know, and she's going like this to me. Don't worry about it. You know, like it's nothing. So finally, we get in the in the car, and they want me to sit in the front. But I don't. I go in the back. I said, no, no, no. I'd be more comfortable back there. And uh, driving there, he was very – he's looking at me in the mirror while we're talking. And uh, he's, he's actually a charming guy. You know, he wasn't scary at that point. Uh, he laughed a little bit. Um, you know, he was – Friendly. I mean, any any gate, and we were really going for me to be introduced as his uh, sales manager for this new company they put together. So I was meeting other partners of his that were all legitimate guys. And uh, when I got to the restaurant, uh, the uh, reception was ridiculous. I mean, everybody in the restaurant came running over. The owner, who was the cook, came out of the back. The son was a bartender. Uh, he came out. Uh, all the waiters and hosts, everybody came over. He had a table in the corner, all set up for him with the wine he liked. And so now, I mean, now it's just coming together. I'm, I'm starting to picture movies, The Godfather and stuff that I've seen when people like this get treated. Then we, uh, we sit down, the partners come in. And after a little small talk, not much small talk at all, he introduces me as his nephew. And he says, Larry's our new sales manager. Not I'd like to present him. I'd like him to try it out. I'd like, he's told him, this is your new sales manager. And oh, great. They're shaking my hand like I'm I'm the underboss already. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. So I left there feeling a little good. You know, I feel feeling really good. I had this position in the company. And uh, it's like, you don't have any clue where it's going to go. Just figure I'm going to be this guy's sales manager and he's going to help me be successful. That's the thought I had at that, you know, at that first meeting, never thinking I would be his right hand man in the other life. And I'm looking at these pictures. It's like, it's almost like the ghost from the past. I'm on yeah. the phone. The FBI is taking a picture of me. Junior's staring at me like he wants to kill me. Scappy's got the cigar, you know, yeah. and Greg at the end, you know, it's crazy, crazy. So all these guys had a touch to my life along the way later on. Yeah, and it's like, uh, yeah. yeah, like you said, it's like ghosts yeah. from the past, and mm -hmm. it's like different chapters yeah. of your life. It's like you didn't even yeah. weren't even mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Now, yeah. were you around any gangsters before this point in your life? My uncle Albert was the closest thing I knew to be a respected neighborhood guy. People came to him for favors, and as I got a little older, don't forget at this point I'm seventeen and a half, maybe eighteen. Well, no, when I met them. That night, I was 18. When I met Linda, I wasn't 18 yet. I was still 17. That's a borderline child. I mean, yeah, nowadays, you know, they, I just, it would be like, I just became, you know, I, I just, I, when I met her, I had to ride my bicycle to the house. I didn't have a license yet. So it's, you know, it's, you put it into perspective. Uh, but then, you know, so, but I did know my Uncle Albert had connections like when the Yankees were playing the uh, Kansas City Royals in the playoffs, you couldn't get a ticket. Impossible. He got three tickets. We were right behind the dugout. And it's a night where George Brett hit a home run in the top of the ninth. And Chris Chambliss hit a home run in the bottom of the ninth. 
The fans stormed the field. It was unbelievable. I was at that game. He also took wow. me to opening night at the Meadowlands, the racetrack. So he took it like if uh, my bike got stolen or something when I was a little kid, the next day I had a brand new bike in it. My Uncle Albert would buy it. So he was always that different type of guy. And he would have been uh, higher up in that family, except for the guy that he wound up under, Nicky Black, believe it or not. He he didn't didn't do nearly as much work as my uncle Albert. Not even close. I mean, it's here and here. It's not even close. My uncle had more balls than Nikki Black, 10 times, 20 times over. So when something had to be done and that crew was asked, Nikki went to Albert, Uncle Albert. And he would get the guys together, whatever. But this guy never wanted Albie to be above him. So he would never. And he stood behind the thing that happened to my uncle when he was a kid. At that turning point, that 17 years old, he don't want to go to school anymore. So his father, my, uh, would be my grandfather, uh, my, cause he's my sister, my mom's brother. Okay. He gives him an ultimatum. You're going to get a job or you're going to go in the army. So his first reaction was to sign up for civil service jobs, fire department, uh, garbage, sanitation, and police department. He's 17. What does he know about being a cop and not being a... This is your job. Yeah. He bypasses all that and goes to the army. When he comes home, he gets back in that life. And he's tight with Junior Persigo. He's tight with uh, Sally D'Ambrosio, who was an old-time, real tough guy that nobody would mess with. Uh, he wound up getting killed, probably for that reason. You know, people were afraid of him. Uh, and I, Nikki now put it out there that when he got straightened out, because he was high in the, uh, the teamsters and he made a lot of money. So as a favor, they straightened him out. They made him and he put it out there right away about my uncle Albert taking the police test years ago. So they that pass was like around the paper, right? And they ask when you they pass about... it around and they hear that, it's like, but he didn't need to do that. You're a 17 year old kid, you didn't take the test. And here's the best part here's the best part. Nikki Black gets straightened out, and he was actually a motorcycle cop for a while. Yeah, yeah, the state trooper. All right. And wow. the only reason he got straightened out again is because of the money and the Teamsters and Junior. That guy right there, where is he? <laughs> Junior Persigo put a stipulation in that even though he's doing this favor, never, ever rise above soldier. So as the years went on, and there was another split in the family, like the Columbus have been fighting forever, the, this last war, Nikki chooses the other side. It's his chance to now move up. So, oh, so Nikki you know, you're going to stay in that position unless he went to the other side. Right. He was never going anywhere. Okay. What, what about uh, Albert? What was his position going to be once this war broke out and everything? No, he told he told Nikki Black when uh, Nikki went to him and told him that he was going to kill me and my partner Jimmy if we don't come over to the other side. So he looked at Nikki and he said, "They used to call me Butchie. That was my young, grown up name." He says, "My nephew Butchie is true blue. In other words, you're not. You're turning on Junior. I was true blue to my my guy, and he was true blue to." The junior so uh he told him that and uh a couple of days later we got nikki and my uncle was real happy about that real happy but there's other guys that that said they were stepping up to get albie straightened out they wanted it. He, he deserved it uh if anything would have happened with me if the war would have became complete and i would have moved up a little bit uh i would have certainly pushed for him and there's other guys, serious guys that, that said the same thing, you know. But you know what's funny, too? There's a there's always this talk about who's made, who's not made, who got made in the bathroom, my ceremony, how it was, whatever. But it really doesn't mean that much when you think about it. Because there's guys, you go all the way back to Bugsy Siegel. He could never get made. He was one of the most feared gangsters in history. So what does it mean? Somebody's going to say something, well, you're not made. You're Meyer Lansky, too. Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky, right. right. He, I don't know that he was so much in on the 
the fighting end of it. He was, he was the brains. But you're right, Ryan Lansky. How about you, McIntosh? You, yeah, McIntosh, was Junior Persico's best friend of all time. Of all time. Okay? He couldn't get straightened out because his father, uh, I, I guess his father was Irish, McIntosh. He was Irish. Yeah. You know, even though his mother was Italian. But there has been instances of people who are not Italian getting straightened well, out. it's happening. It's happening yeah. now more and more, yeah. Or not full-blooded. You know? Or they didn't know that they were. Or they didn't know, were, right. They were, so, yeah. Right. But I'm saying guys like that, and then there's a guy like my Uncle Albert that really never got the, the button, had the respect, but because of some scumbag above him, you know, a uh, jealous or fearful guy, holds them back. You know, and there's a lot of kids that get made because their daddies are in and they get, they don't have to do the work that some others had to do. You know, uh, there's guys out there right now. they they ran away during the war. They ran away. Now they're like running things. They're really, they're there. They're, they're moving up guys that were caught just as us. Guys from, and they're all over the 13th Avenue, Avenue X guys. I grew up with a good fellas. Now that, it's they if they go another 20 years in the life they're in right now, they can't do the work I did with my with our crew. There's no way there. the time has no changed way. So, so much so, that right. So I'm saying that guy, without mentioning any names, whatever it's having you, having you X, 13th Avenue, whichever ones they are, that are in that position now, that did nothing to get there other than they were they're scraping the bottom of the barrel because there's no quality left. So they become, they get positions now and they want to badmouth guys like me. You forget that the work I did and, the, and not only me, my partner Jimmy and, and Greg, even though he was, you know, what he turned out to be and uh, our whole crew, there's a lot of guys. I just don't want to name them all because some of them are off on in the sunset, you know? Yeah, what if Persico uh, side lost the war? What would have happened then? Yeah. yeah, no, if we didn't do what we did, all of these guys would be answering probably the Vicarino or, or somebody over there. 